Patrick takes the snap, drops back, lobs it back right corner. Decker! He's got it! Touchdown! Eric Decker scores! And the Jets have won it in overtime! This is the Jet Take with Ben Blessington and Kyle Fahey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 69th episode of the Jet Take. It's nice today. Um, correction, it is Kyle Fahey and Scott Mason from the Play Like the Jet podcast tonight. You guys are used to Scott by now. Um, Scott, what's <laughs> going on, man? I love that. You're yeah. used to him. It's kind of like you got an acquired taste, I think, right? It, well... Ben's been gone for so long. I mean, people, it's they're adjusting their palate, you know. Yeah, I just got a I just got a text from Ben telling me not to. Apparently, there's some sort of internal strike with you two that I'm not getting <laughs> in the middle of. But what else is new with you guys? Wait, wait, wait! Read the text. I'm not gonna read it, but let's just say that he said that this show will not be uploaded. That's funny. All right. Well. That's a cuck move by Ben, but this is the 69th episode of the I Look, I don't want to get in the middle of you two. I told you I would, I would do the show with you. You are the marriage now counselor. He's get, now he's getting, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying. I don't want you or Ben to be mad at me. I'm the marriage counselor. I'm trying to be in the middle. So, Ben, if you happen to be listening to this, don't be he's upset not. at me. Yeah. Well, yeah he's, I mean, uh, look, he's studying for finals, so hopefully he gets a good grade. Yeah, I wish Ben the best of luck, and he goes to Syracuse so he can never record. That'd be awesome. All right. You can record from have... Syracuse. What? You can do recording in Syracuse. It's allowed. It's not against the law in Syracuse. Well, I'm assuming the white-collar man he is, he'll be in a fraternity. <laughs> so I don't know how, you know, quiet those are going to be, especially on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock. So, uh, hmm. I don't know. But anyway. You're trying to say he'll be in a kegger on a Wednesday? Yeah. yeah hold, hold on, guys. I've got to chug this real quick. <laughs> All right, I'm back. So, we actually have Jets news to talk about. Uh, kind of breaking. I think we're going to be the first podcast to this. Uh, John Morton, Johnny Morton, good old Johnny, fired. Gone. Finito. Um, one year stint. It actually wasn't bad. Statistically, it was pathetic. But if you watched the games, you knew that this was the best Jets offense sent, well, since 2015 when Ryan Fitzpatrick and Brandon Marshall. But in the grand scheme of things, the best Jets offense in a long time. Um, and working with guys like Josh McCown, um, Matt Forte, Bilal Powell, Austin Severian Jenkins when he wasn't getting screwed over by the refs, etc. Um, obviously, some bright spots on this offense that he made the most out of, like Robbie Anderson and Austin Safarian Jenkins sometimes, like I said, when he wasn't getting screwed over by the refs. But this was a move, I guess, that doesn't come as a surprise. Rich Samini, you know, he kind of reported this like two weeks ago, and even before that there were rumors about him possibly going to Oakland. So this was a move I think we all foresaw coming. But now, you know, rumors circulating that right now, I think in my head, I've narrowed it down to three candidates who are legitimate options for the Jets. Scott, I'll let you get the first Jet take in on this, but give us, sure. give us your initial thoughts on the firing. Did you expect it? And what do you think the next move is from here? Well, I mean, I, there were rumblings, and it appeared for a while that Morton had some very powerful enemies. There was talk that one of those enemies was Todd Bowles, and obviously... If you're butting heads with the head coach and he wants you out, unless you're some big-time amazing coordinator, there's a good chance you're going to be knocked out. And that's what it looks like happened here. I don't like moves. I think John Morton did a pretty good job this year. I've had a lot of talks with Joe Blewett from Jet Nation Radio about this. And more to the point, Kyle, you and I on the post-game podcast, the last one of the year, uh, we had Mark Schofield, who was also a Jet Take guest, and he came on to talk about the Jets and the Patriots, and he talked about John Morton, and he had mentioned that he watched a lot of the Jet offense in preparing for his shows this week with, uh, that week with Lockdown Patriots. <clears throat> and what he said was that 
he noticed that Morton was doing a terrific job of really scheming around his talent, especially at the quarterback position with Josh McCown. He was designing plays that were easier for McCown uh, as far as his skill set went. He was able to do different air raid concepts and stuff like that. And what Schofield told me, and it made me a little encouraged, was he goes, you know, I know a lot of people are worried about the Jets being able to develop a quarterback, but if Morton is in place, I think that if they do draft the guy, that he would be somebody that could be really good at being able to scheme around him and bring him along kind of in a way similar to what Sean McVay did this year with the Rams and, and Jared Goff. Well, that's out the window now. And Mark Schofield and I were joking that we were a big jinx because I think right after, like maybe like within hours of us recording that and posting it is when the report dropped the first one that Morton might be on his way out and this and that. So I don't like the move. I never like it when a guy gets shoved out, especially when crap like that gets leaked because you know people that have an agenda are doing it. I hope that he lands on his feet. I think if nothing else, Gruden will find a spot for him on a staff somewhere, maybe as a special assistant to the head coach or something. Somebody will pick him up and he'll be okay, but I I don't like the move. Jeremy Bates is the name that you hear a lot internally. Joe Filippi, God love him, who is still, still holding on to that Hackenberg fantasy, just DM'd me a little while ago and said, hey, Jeremy Bates, he's the biggest fan in the building of Hack." Like, oh, man, Joe, I love you, but you got to give up that ghost. So he's the guy that gets talked about internally. There was rumors that Todd Haley, who was just fired by the Steelers and who has ties to the Jets, he was an assistant at one point, and his father worked in the personnel office for many years. There's talk of him coming in. I thought he largely has done a pretty good job as an offensive coordinator. I thought he did well with the Cardinals, and I thought he also did well uh, with the Steelers in his recent stint, but he, there's a combustible personality there, and he was kind of forced out in Pittsburgh because he didn't get along with Ben and really never has, and it came to a, a head. So that's a possibility, and he's a guy that obviously has a solid track record. The other one and the one that I think Jets Twitter is, is buzzing about is John B. Filippo, the quarterback's coach with the Eagles, and the big thing there is he has a really strong track record of working with young quarterbacks, Specifically, the most recent one, obviously, is Carson Wentz, and we saw what he did with him. Sometimes I'm a little hesitant to just say, oh, well, this guy's a quarterback whisperer or something like that just because you work with a guy like Carson Wentz. I mean, who's to say that it wasn't just that Carson Wentz? But he does have a track, a track record and a pattern that make it seem like he knows what he's doing. So if he were to come in here, I think a lot of the Jets fans would be a little more comfortable if they miss out on Cousins and the idea of them drafting a quarterback and developing him. So those guys look to be the early front runners. I know there are some people that were talking about Bruce Arians. I can't see any scenario where he would want to – I mean, he seems to be a guy that just wants to keep his hand in things but doesn't want to be the full-time guy doing the 14-, 16-hour days anymore. If he wanted that, he'd have plenty of opportunities elsewhere, either as a head coach or whatever. So I could see a world where Arians, who is very close with Todd Bowles, in fact, uh, Todd Bowles, in a weird sense, cost Arians the Bears job years ago because Arians was more or less offered the job, but they wanted to give him, I forget who it was, as the defensive coordinator, and Arians said, I will not take this job unless Todd Bowles is my defensive coordinator. So they passed, and then they ended up going to Arizona together. So they're very close. There's almost like a father-son kind of thing there. So I'm sure, and he's mentioned this, he'll be in camp and maybe they can rope him into being some sort of consultant where he'll review tape and give pointers or something. But I don't think that's anything that anybody should think will happen. But so that, that both, that's what I would say early on. I know that was a mouthful, but that seems to be what happened is that Morton got shoved out by people that have more stroke than him. I don't really like the move, but it is what it is. And now we wait and see. Which candidate emerges? Yeah, um, I mentioned before we really got into it that, you know, Morton being gone, um, I don't necessarily hate the move. Uh, I'm also, I'm like right in between on this, and I think it depends on what we're going to do after. Because if we hire Jeremy Bates, I'm going to be pissed. 
because you don't fire John Morton, a guy who in this year has shown a lot with little talent around him, for a guy in Jeremy Bates who literally did nothing. Nothing. He got a career year out of Josh McCown, but who's to say Josh McCown hasn't always had that? He's just never had a full season or a decent supporting cast. So say what you want about Jeremy Bates and say what all these Twitter like all these Twitter warriors say what they want. Jeremy Bates is unproven as a coach. He's not ready to be a play caller. He proved that at USC. There's a reason he was out of the league for a while. Okay? Now John Morton, you know, I'm not going to say he's a great offensive coordinator. He's a good offensive coordinator. I don't think he deserved to be fired. And I, like Scott, as you were saying, I think there was another hand in play here. I don't know whose hand it was, but it must be a powerful one because it was, it easily slapped the mosquito out of the sky. So what we go from here and the three candidates that I mentioned earlier, who I think we're down to at this point is one, Jeremy Bates, higher from within, um, Big hack guy, reportedly. Uh, Todd Haley, who was, I guess, let go this morning. His contract was up, meaning, you know, they're not going to resire him. Um, He's done a lot of good things in Pittsburgh. He's developed a lot of really good players. I wouldn't be against it. And then there's Bruce Arians, which would be my pick. But I don't think that one will give up anything for him because he's still under contract with the Cardinals, if if I'm correct. We would have to give them some sort of compensation. Now, I don't know what they would want in return, but I'm not going to sit here and be ignorant and say, oh, yeah, they're just going to let their head coach who's under contract retire and then go be the offensive coordinator somewhere else for free. No, that's not how the NFL works. So I think right now the most likely of candidates is Todd Haley. And as I said, Bruce Aarons would be my pick because I consider him the best quarterback whisperer in the NFL. You just look what he's done with certain players – Ben Roethlisberger, Carson Palmer, Andrew Luck gotten career years out of all of them. Now, obviously, they all have talent, but the Jets have that sixth pick, and there's going to be a quarterback with talent there most likely. You can probably get the most out of them. But, like I said, unlikely that we can get them. So, realistically, we're down to Todd Haley and Jeremy Bates. I, I'm i going to state the claim I'm 100% against Jeremy Bates. Uh, I will replace my captain uh, hat of the – Todd Bullship, getting him fired, to the Jeremy Bates is not my offensive coordinator. You know what? I'll be the first to do hashtag not my offensive coordinator if he gets hired. (laughs) I'm staking my claim right now. I'm so against it. It would set us back. Not only is he a hack guy, which means it sets us back for at least two years. He has a terrible track record as a play caller. He was fired. Like, he was out of the league. That doesn't change, and he's really proven not a lot. Now, I did make a prediction earlier this offseason that John Morton would go somewhere else, Jeremy Bates would step up, and Josh McCown would become the quarterback's coach. Now, if that comes true, I don't know. I'm, I'm Nostradamus, and I need to start picking lottery numbers. But <laughs> this, this, this could go either very good for the Jets with an upgrade in Todd Haley or very bad for the Jets and a downgrade to Jeremy Bates, to summarize. And I know that was a mouthful. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's – look, I'm not as down on Bates as you are. I think Morton did a good job this year and enough for me to want to see more. I think the fact that people who I respect seem to like the job he did made me feel a little more at ease with my own opinion. It's, always, it's kind of one of those things where you have your opinion and then when other people that really know their stuff – also share that opinion. It kind of makes you feel a little more comfortable in your own opinion. That's sort of how I felt with John Morton this year. I thought he did a pretty good job. And then other people like Mark Schofield and Joe Blewett were saying the same thing. And I was like, okay, then I'm not crazy. So I liked – the funny thing about it is Morton came here because he was like their one millionth choice, basically. And it's the same thing people are saying about yeah, John. Yeah, it wasn't right? their first choice. I mean, right. We lit- right. I was sitting at the Pro Bowl – and, you know, in Orlando, I, I forget the name of the stadium. Um, I think it's Stadium, uh, Camping World Stadium uh, in Orlando. I was at the Pro Bowl. I was walking in, going to my seats. Had pretty nice seats. They had, like, flat-screen TVs on the outside. I had his look over. It's Jets hire John Morton as offensive coordinator. The Pro Bowl is in February. Most teams hire their offensive coordinators mid-January. I mean, we didn't get our pick. We, we wanted John DeFilippo. 
That's who we wanted. And honestly, it would have been a good hire. And John Morton ended up being a good hire. So I don't think anybody should take this as a shock. I think the timing of it's a little shocking. Um, they must really want a guy badly. And they know they can well, get him. Well, the thing, the thing, too, with Morton is just because he wasn't necessarily their first pick. Like, that was the argument that was always used against Hedzik. And now, look, I'm not saying Hedzik did a good job. But it doesn't really matter if it was anybody else's pick or if other teams in the league wanted him or this or that. The, the question is, okay, should he have been hired? Maybe, maybe not. But then once he is, it's all a matter of what he's done. And you mentioned it. Statistically, the Jet offense was no, no great chase this year. But let's remember what they had. They had a not-so-great offensive line. For all the pl- uh, praise that Brandon Shell has gotten, he was really nothing special this year. He was banged up, too. Carpenter and Winters both played poorly, and Winters had an excuse because he'd been playing badly hurt all year. So, fine, but those two played poorly. Beecham was probably the most consistent member of the offensive line, and he was okay. There's nothing amazing. but Reverse he the curse. Least, yeah, there Reverse you go. The he curse, reversed the jet, the jet take curse. And you had Wesley Johnson, who was arguably the worst center in the NFL. He was just pathetic. And the reason why I'm not for cutting James Carpenter is because he has a manageable cap figure, and I'm optimistic that if they get a decent center in there, it'll help because we saw that once uh, the Jets went on that spending spring in 2008 and brought in Alan Fennick and Damian Woody, it elevated the play of Mangold and Ferguson, who had struggled a bit the year before. So I'm optimistic there. But then if you look at the other weapons, and let's be honest, first of all, Josh McCown is a career journeyman. Now, he had a really good year for him this year. It wasn't some incredible year. But by Josh McCown's standards, look, he, we know what he was. He was limited. But I felt like John Morton got the absolute maximum out of Josh McCown. The only other guy that got this kind of quality out of McCown was Mark Tressman in Chicago years ago. But other than that, McCown has been on a million teams for a reason, right? And then, as far as offensive weapons, I mean, let's be real about this. I love Robbie Anderson as much as the next guy. He's a great deep threat, and he really took a nice step forward this year, and that's good. And Austin Safarian Jenkins, I thought, was probably the best receiving threat the Jets have had at tight end since Dustin Keller. But that offense just didn't have a lot of weapons. The running backs were not great. Alal Powell, we all love him. He's, he's better than what the coaching staff seems to think he is, but I think it's gotten to the point where the fan base has overrated him a little bit. He's a, he's a nice player, but he's nothing amazing. Elijah McGuire had that one really nice run against the Jaguars. Besides that, he had some flashes here and there, but he was nothing amazing. We all know that Matt Forte was running like a man who had his feet tied to an anchor the whole year. He was running in slow motion. Jermaine Curse is okay. He's a solid wide NFL wide receiver, but he's not keeping def- defenses awake at night. And – so that and Jeremy Curley, you know, is another guy that when he was around, a, a capable pair of hands, but nothing much more than that. So if you look at that offense, there really wasn't a lot to work with there. And I feel like Morton, for the most part, got the most. And there were people that would complain he passed too much, he'd run too much, he let, took his foot off the gas. Like, look, he wasn't perfect, clearly. But I thought overall he did a lot with a little. And I thought he showed that he was a capable play caller and he at least did enough for me to want to see more next season. Think of it this way, Kyle. I know you're a young man, but you, you'll probably get what I'm saying anyway. It's kind of like mm-hmm. if you go out on a, date, a first date with a girl and you have a fun time and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to want to marry this girl or if we're ever going to get engaged or anything like that or if we're going to ever become serious. But there was enough on this date to make me want to go out with her again. Like, we had a good enough time that I kind of I would like to see her again. That's kind of how I felt with John Morton. I felt like he did a nice job, and I, it made me want to see what he could do in year two when he maybe has some actual weapons on offense when Anunua comes back, when they have an actual quarterback, whether that ends up being Kirk Cousins, my lips to God's ears, or one of the rookies in the draft. When he has some wide receivers to go with uh, 
to go with those guys, to go with a new one, Anderson, whether it's signing somebody like Allen Robinson or just adding another guy in free agency, uh, getting an actual – an actual center in there, uh, maybe upgrading running back. If he has actual personnel, I'd like to see what he could do. So, Because remember, Kyle, everybody expected the Jet offense to be pretty much the worst in the NFL, and they weren't. They were, they were you know, 26th. Yeah, which is still better than 32nd, which is what we all expected. And that's cool. just statistically. Straight facts. You know? Welcome to the Jet take. Only spit in the truth. <laughs> that's right. I'm not going to sit here. Uh, we've said this many times. We're not here to try and sell you merchandise. We're here to just, this is eh, what well, we think. Well, hold on. Don't don't speak for me there. I'm always trying to sell you on something. All right, if you want to go to theloyalist.com slash turn on the Jets and purchase a yes. play like Buy a Jets shirt, people. feel free. Yeah. But, that was our and so, but you get my promotion. point. Our main... We sure buy buy merchandise, but that's not our main goal here. Our main, or as uh, uh, the character on Lost one said, wouldn't call it our primary objective, right? So that that's kind of how I, I look at it with with the Jet offense. They were expected to be bad. They weren't great this year, but given what he had to work with, Morton showed enough for me to be intrigued and want to see more next year. And now we won't get that. And I don't know. We'll see. Like you said, Todd Haley's an established guy. Wouldn't be the worst guy in the world to bring in here. The interesting thing would be, you know, in Pittsburgh, he was used to working with an established star in Ben Roethlisberger. When he was in Arizona, you know, it was a different story over there as well. It's not like he had you know, a young quarterback that he was really building up and when he was with the Chiefs and so on and so forth. So I don't know. We'll see. I think everybody would love to see DiFilippo. I don't know that that's a move that happens. If it does, no. I think a lot of people will be happy. But we'll see. I think Arians is a pipe dream. I think there's a 0% chance, roughly, of him becoming the offensive coordinator. Whatever, it was compensation, I don't even think that matters. I just think there's a reason Arians retired, and it's not to go be an offensive coordinator somewhere. So we'll see. But it's interesting for sure. You know, again, all the leaks to Samini and to uh, our friend Manish Mehta, and by friend I mean not our friend Manish Mehta, when, when those leaks start happening and you keep hearing the refrain, you mentioned it. I said powerful friends. You said power, uh, excuse me, powerful, I said powerful enemies. You said powerful enemies. And what it sounds like is that Todd Bowles and John Morton were just not on the same page. And, you know, that's the way it goes is if the offensive coordinator and the coach are not on the same page and somebody's going to go, it's going to be the offensive coordinator. And to be honest, I think there's a portion of the Jets fan base that would have preferred Morton stay as the coach and Bowles get kicked to the curb, but that's just not how it worked out. So we'll see now. It'll be interesting. It gives us some more things to talk about until free agency comes up. And, man, I'm telling you, it's going to be a long, what, two months until that legal tampering period starts? Yeah. And, you know, right now I'm, I'm looking at Todd Haley's, you know, career. He was with the Jets for one year as a scouting assistant. And right, then, right. That's what I was saying uh, before. Jets, as a wide receiver coach for three years with the Jets from 97 to 2000. So he does mm-hmm. have some familiarity with the, you And know, his father guess, worked with the te- his father worked for the team for years, too. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. So he does have familiarity here. Maybe he considers his home. Um, I'm looking back. He was with the Steelers from 2012, obviously, to up in this year. So I'm looking, you know, obviously the Steelers are a great, great team. Never going to beat the Patriots, though. They're a great team, not only because of Ben Roethlisberger, but because of guys like Le'Veon Bell, because of guys like Antonio Brown, Juju Smith-Schuster, and the great offensive line they have. And then they just well, and it's because of- overall, Kyle, the the main thing with the Steelers, and it's what built built all consistent contenders, is, and this has been a huge problem for the Jets for a long time, is that they hit on picks in the mid to late rounds on a fairly yep. consistent basis. That's how you be, that's how you stay a successful franchise. You, look, I'm not going to say anybody can hit on first round picks because we've seen a ton of first round busts, right? But obviously, statistically, it's a lot easier to hit on a first or a second round pick 
than it is to hit on mid to late rounders. And that that's one of the things, and we'll get into this uh, later on, I, I suspect, when we talk about all the nonsense going on with John Idzik and all the fighting going on over that. But, you know, you look at, like, Mike McCagney, you know, one of my big criticisms of him is he's supposed to be this big football man and this football expert. But if you look at the vast majority of quote-unquote hits that he's had in the draft, it's been Leonard Williams, Jamal Adams, Marcus May, first round picks. I, I guess you could say hit on Shell in the fourth, uh, what was it, the fifth round? They traded a fourth round pick to get it. Okay. But they, they haven't, over the last three years, there are not a lot of picks that they hit on in the mid to late rounds. So that's what he's going to have to do. But that that's what it was with the Steelers, is that that's why they're successful. I mean, it helps that they have Ben Roethlisberger, obviously but the core of the team is built. Like you said, Juju Smith-Schuster was a second rounder, but it just seems like they find guys like Juju Smith-Schuster who some people have thought early in the process could have been a first round-ish type pick and instead slides and they end up getting him and then he ends up, you know, Antonio Brown's a fifth round pick, right? There you go. Um, I actually have the drafts in front of me. Sixth round pick. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. By the way, a little bit of trivia there for you, Kyle. Uh-oh. I don't know if you know this, but the way the Steelers got Antonio Brown was... Yeah, San Antonio Holmes, the trade. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So it's always... And, and you know, the same thing happened with the Jets with Brett Favre. That pick that they used for Brett... Uh, they traded away for Brett Favre turned into Jordy Nelson, so... Um... I don't consider Jordan Nelson that good. But anyway, uh, my roundabout point here okay. uh, on Todd Haley, he was with the organization, the Steelers, from 2012, obviously, up until this year. So I'm looking at the offensive players that were drafted. We'll start in 2012. I'll, you know, I'm not going to go pick by pick or anything, but I'm going to go with the noticeable ones. Uh, first round pick, 2012, David DeCastro, all pro guard. Um, doing pretty well. Obviously had the talent, 24 overall pick, Stanford, Pretty much a machine for offensive linemen in the NFL. They seem to produce a guy who goes to the Pro Bowl, I want to say, every two years, basically. Um, I'm not sure how much credit I'm going to give to him, but, you know, obviously DeCastro has been playing on a consistent level for a while under the same offensive coordinator. So I'm also not going to say, oh, that's not Todd Haley, but I'm not going to say that's all Todd Haley. Uh, seventh round, Kelvin Beecham, a great value pick. Seventh round, I mean, he was at a Pro Bowl level for basically two years, and he got hurt. Uh, then he went to the Jags, now obviously with us. Jet Take member had a good year this year. Um, so I could say that he knows how to pick offensive linemen so far, you know, in his couple of drafts. Because when he was with the Jets, he was also a scouting assistant. So I'm going to assume, just going to assume that he definitely has some sort of say in this. Obviously the offensive coordinator has a say in the guys who he likes and, you know, fit the scheme and whatever. But he has a background in scouting and, you know, he knows when he sees a good player. You know, correct me if I'm maybe overanalyzing that, Scott, but I think that's a fair assumption. Yeah, that sounds fair. Okay. 2013, second-round pick, Le'Veon Bell. Honestly, the kid should have been a first-round pick. I think they were off the field problems regarding marijuana usage in college and then some other character problems. Uh, I think he got caught with a gun in his car. I'm pretty sure that was Le'Veon Bell. Um, so they got him in the second round. Great pick. Uh, third round, Marcus Wheaton, contributor. I mean, they've gotten a consistent contributor out of the third round. I know, obviously, he's working with Ben Roethlisberger, but, you know, he's been a solid guy for them. Uh, Landry Jones in the fourth round. I hate Landry Jones. I have a personal problem with him, so I'm going to be completely biased on this pick. I don't think he's good, so I'm going to hold that against Todd Haley. Um, even if I wasn't biased, though, I'm pretty sure that he's bad, right? To repeat Jones, that yeah. last part about Landry, Landry Jones. Jones. Yeah, he's bad. Yeah, right? no, he's, hard, he's terrible. He's terrible. Yeah. Okay, good. That's why I'm biased towards him because I don't like him. Like as I'm biased because I hate Oklahoma, but yeah, he's he's brutal. He's terrible. Yeah. Uh, 2014, Dre Archer. He does have an awesome name, though. I'm not gonna lie. Landry Jones is a pretty sweet name for a quarterback. Um. That's a hot take. That's a very hot oh, take. 
it's a, that's such a quarterback. It's a cool quarterback name because first of all, Tom Landry, and second of all, I think old white guy when I hear Landry. I don't want that as my quarterback. <laughs> he is a legend, though. And the other one is, if you ever watched uh, Friday Night Lights, the character Landry was one, mm-hmm. one of my favorites. So I just think, I think it's a Baker cool name. Mayfield's better quarterback name. That is a cool name. Yeah, that is a cool name. Can't I can't wait. I can't wait for when we start pumping out Broadway Baker shirts. <laughs> well, if that if he ends up getting picked by the Jets, and we'll we'll talk. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit, but. Uh, Chris, Crystal Levitas, I'm sure, is going to be the first one to buy that. Crystal Levitas from uh, Locker Room Update, who's, I think, Baker Mayfield's biggest fan. I, I don't know if she would either confirm or deny. She probably has a Baker Mayfield tattoo on her neck or something. But uh, if he wow. gets kicked by the Jets, I think she may be the first one to buy a Broadway Baker shirt. Um, we got we to gotta do something with that video of him trying to outrun the cops. Like, we just got to blow that up and put it on a shirt. Honestly. I would buy that. That's why the Giants might want to pick him. You would fit right in right now, huh? Yeah. He's a gritty individual, man. He tried to run away from the cops while staggering drunk, knew he was surrounded. He took the risk. He called his own number on fourth down. (laughs) You know, it came up bad for him. The hit that he took, and, you know, I really need to start getting these sound bites, like, prepared. I... I know the video has sound, just like the sound of his skull hitting the like concrete wall when he uh, gets slammed by the cop. It's like, like Edward Norton. Get, uh, it's like Edward Norton doing the curb stomping in American History X. You just ew, ew, tough to tough to see. I you can't get sued. You know this is another plus for drafting Baker Mayfield. You know if they if he sues you, 50 years down the road for CTE, you can just point <laughs> to that video. True. So, full proof fan right there. All right, anyway, off topic, a, kind of what we point. do here. Uh, 2014 Steelers draft, Dre Archer, Martavis Bryant, Wesley Johnson. They drafted Wesley Johnson. Um, well, Martavis, Martavis Bryant is an example, though, right? He was a, yeah, now, Martavis. listen, there were red flags, and there's a reason why he dropped to the fourth round. But it just yeah. seems like the Steelers are an example of a team that always finds that guy. That like exactly. There are always those guys that, dra- that drop. And some of them are busts, and some of them turn out to be good. And the Steelers are one of those teams that always somehow finds those guys, you know? Yeah. It's like uh, Cincy with Joe, Joe Mixon this year. Great talent, concerning off the field issues. Uh, Wesley Johnson. To say the least. <laughs> now, as much as I don't like Wesley Johnson as a player, I think he's a bad player. For a fifth-round pick, a guy who has ended up starting for a year and a half now, at a below average level, that's not a terrible pick. You're getting a producer in the fifth round. So. Yeah, I mean, I've always said that. If you get a guy that could be a rotational piece in the fifth or sixth, it's like I was talking to somebody today, and we were talking about Tommy Bohannon, and he was like, oh, Tommy Bohannon stinks. He's a waste of time. I'm like, it's a pro bowler. He's like, oh, well, it's a fullback pro bowler. No one uses fullbacks. I'm like, okay, fine. But if you get a Pro well, Bowler at any position... the AFC Championship, you know. Well, right, but the point is, if you get a Pro Bowler at any position in the seventh round, that's a win. That's 100% a win. You can't, you're not going to tell me that Tommy Wilhannon in the seventh round wasn't a good pick. When you pick a guy in the seventh round, I don't care what... Even if he's a punter. If you get a seventh-round punter that goes to the Pro Bowl, that's a good pick. Yeah, like, kind of like a Lachlan Edwards situation. Sure. Yeah, well, hopefully... All right, 2015, Sammy Coates, Jesse James. Um, those were the only offensive players taken. You know, both Jesse of them James are James was good, man. He's a good player. Yeah, both of them were big producers for Pittsburgh. Yeah, sure. Then 2016, um, DeMarcus Ayers, they took him in seventh round. I don't see any other. Well, actually, Gerald Hawkins, tackle at LSU. Um I mean, they're, they've only been in the league for two years now, so I think it might be a little early for them. But they were also fifth and seventh round picks. So, you know. Right. You're not yeah. necessarily working with the greatest there. And then 2017 this year, Juju Smith-Schuster, James Conner, Joshua Dobbs, and that's it. Uh, I can tell you that Juju Smith-Schuster, very good, should have been a first round pick. 
overlooked because of its size. You know, teams are regarding it now. I think most of us at TOJ, you know, thought the same thing about him when he was coming sure. out. And then cool name, James too. Connor. Then James Connor, who struggled with injuries this year. I think he, I think he had a knee injury. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, not only a great story, a great football player. You know, he, mm -hmm. he's just good. He did very well in the preseason. Unfortunately, he had injuries this year. But, you right. know, and you may be, somebody may have skipped just like to the middle of this episode and may not know what we're talking about. Todd Haley has consistently picked producers on the offensive level in the later rounds. Notice that in exception to David DeCastro, all these guns that I named were late round picks. Calvin Beecham, seventh round pick. Le'Veon Bell, second round pick. Right. Landry Jones, fourth round pick. Martavis Bryant, fourth round pick. Sammy Coates, third round pick. Jesse James, third round pick. No, I'm sorry. Jesse James, where'd he go? Fifth round pick. Guys who right. are producers for them, and obviously they have a quarterback to build around, and I know that makes it different. But when you find your quarterback, because you have the opportunity to do it this offseason, and so you bring in mm -hmm. Todd Haley, you can go to work in these middle rounds. You can find producers. You can find more Elijah so, McGuire. So you, you can find more. You can. The question more. is, the question is, will they? Because so far, the first three years, McCagnan struggled to do that. And like I was saying today to somebody, and people don't want to hear it, but there's a lot of people that want to still talk badly about John Idzik. And I, look, I'm not saying he did a great job, by the way, but two things can be true at the same time: that John Idzik didn't do a great job when he was the general manager here. Although I still might have consider bringing him back for a third year just to see how his plan played out because clearly his whole thing was kind of what we wanted this year, which was let's tank, right? Clear everything out, get out, get out all the bad contracts, build up some draft picks and see what happens. But either way, you can think that John Idzik didn't do a good job and still look at what Mac has done so far and question it. They've had two five and 11 seasons after an unexpected 10 and six but ultimately, look at the draft picks. There just isn't a lot of quality there. They, they, everybody will talk about Leonard Williams and, and, uh, and Jamal Adams. And, I mean, look, we don't even know what Jamal Adams is going to be yet. I think Leonard Williams is a good player. I don't think he's great. I think he's very good. I don't know that he's an elite-level player like a J.J. Watt or somebody like that. Those are, but will probably both end up being good picks, but... At number six, that's kind of what you're expected to do. What Max had problems with is after that. I mean, look at that 2013 draft. Other than Leonard Williams, take a look. You have the draft up now, right, Kyle? Take a look. After Leonard Williams, I mean, you're talking about guys like, and I'm sorry, he was a former guest of your show, but like Lorenzo Malden, who was very hey, underwhelming. Hey. Buy a T-shirt. Buy a Lorenzo Malden T-shirt. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, but he, he was underwhelming. Deion Simon was on the practice squad, for God's sake. Devin Smith, no, don't get me wrong, and I'll admit this, I'm with several other people, including Joe Caparoso. I was thrilled when the Jets drafted Devin Smith. I thought he was going to be a terrific player. He just seemed to have that knack in a big spot at Ohio State, and I thought it would translate, but the injuries took a toll and the early drop season and all that. So either way, the point is, you look at that first draft and you compare it to Idzik's first draft. Look, in 2013, Idzik drafted Sheldon Richardson at 13, and Sheldon turned out to be one of the best players in that draft. Now, he also did whiff on D. Milner, true. But uh, you look at the rest of it, he found Brian Winters in the third round, who turned into a starting guard. He's not the greatest guard in the world but he's been productive and a starter at, in the th starting guard in the third round is a, is a good pick. And you look at Tommy Bohannon, who was a seventh round draft pick who turned into a pro bowl level fullback. To me, that's a better draft than when Mac did in his first year in 2015. I feel like. Yeah. McCagnin, it's hard to argue with that. I, I thought so, but people were trying to argue with me on it. I don't know why. I think what really and killed it. Dick, <laughs> exactly, Kyle, you're our hitman at TOJ, basically. But I think the thing with Idzik that killed him really was that second draft, the 12 guys that he drafted, and only one of them really turned it. I mean, Kelvin, the funny thing about it is, I, and look, we'll see, the history book will be written on this. I wonder if 
Darren Lee ends up being any better than Calvin Pryor was. And what I mean by that is Calvin Pryor kind of had a shaky rookie year. Then he bounced back and had a solid sophomore season, and then it all kind of went to hell in a handbasket after that, right? Well, what do we know about Darren Lee right now? He had a disappointing rookie year. Then this year he was kind of up and down. What are we going to get out of him next year? Is he ever going to be better than what Calvin Pryor was for as much as we want to talk about how Calvin Pryor was a bust? He had his moments. So is Darren Lee going to be any better than that? I don't know. So you you look at that. And, yeah, the rest of that draft for the most part, again, people will talk. Somebody was saying, oh, he he passed on Martavis Bryant for Jalen Saunders. All right, well, a lot of people passed on Martavis Bryant. Because A, he was very raw, and B, he had baggage. So there's a reason why he slipped to the fourth round and a bunch of teams didn't draft him, right? Um, I'm just, you know, that, that Idzik 12 killed him in the press conference midseason was no good. But it looked to me, like I said, like he was trying to almost tank. Like he wanted to clear everything out and start fresh. That was his plan. He hoarded the cap space so that he could go on the big spending spring in 2015. And he was putting together draft picks and, and things like that. That's what it looked like, and he never got to execute the plan. Now, he may have very well failed miserably because when you have a draft of 12 guys and you don't do all that well, I mean, it's not an encouraging sign. But if you go throughout history, I would bet you that there are GMs that had two drafts that weren't all that good, and they went on to be okay. I mean, or if you look at any general manager, you'll see two-year periods, I'm sure, where they didn't do so well. So, again, I'm not saying I, – I said this at the time when Idzik got fired. I was like, look, if you want to fire Idzik, fire him. I don't, I'm not going to bang my hand on the table. But I would have probably given him a third year. Um, you could, you could – look, I, like I said, I was fine with it one way or the other. And that was the way I feel with McCagnon now, to be perfectly honest. I, if you wanted to tell me you wanted to fire Matt, I'd have said, okay, fine, fire him. If you want to tell me, give him another year, okay. But the stakes are very high this offseason, Kyle, as you know. You, we talked about who they're going to bring in as a potential play caller, right? But really, if Mac doesn't deliver on the personnel end this year, and I'm not, I'm not talking about going out and spending a ton of money on aging guys or overpaying for guys that weren't that good in the first place. You know, the Revis, look, we could all kill him on Revis, but it's something that almost all of us wanted at the time. Revis was still playing at a high level, and we expected that he would continue. And, and the thing was, too, there weren't a lot of red flags. I mean, he'd had the injury. But remember, Kyle, at the time, he was a guy who had a reputation for being the hardest worker out there. He never settled for anything. Everything was a battle, even in practice. If you go and read Collision Low Crossers, you can read all about how competitive Revis was, even in practice, right? So the red flags, nobody would have expected he would give up like that. So you can't really necessarily kill him on, on that move, but paying Marcus Gilchrist, right, bringing back from Marty, spending money on some of these other guys, Fitzpatrick, Brandon Marshall. Brandon Marshall give them one good year, but maybe, I guess I think where, where that plan really went bust is he expected Devin Smith to be the next guy, quote unquote, and it just didn't happen. But we'll see. I mean, that's a thing, hey, Kyle. Hey, hey, we still have a chance with Devin Smith. Yeah, I guess. Listen, if Hackenberg is, uh, is, is in uh, – if they didn't close the book on him, as McCagnin said, then who knows with Devin Smith. But either way, man, that's how it's going to go. It's – ultimately what it comes down to is you have the greatest coordinator in the world, and if he doesn't have any talent to work with, there's a limit to what he can do. He's not a magician, right? So let's see. And quarterbacks too even, man. I mean, as much as I'm banging the drum about Kirk Cousins, if you don't fix the offensive line and give them a couple of weapons to work with, including a running game, I mean, yeah, you'll see a, a noticeable improvement from this past season, but not competing for a Super Bowl. Because even, even if Kirk – look, even if Kirk Cousins was, I don't know, um, Russell Wilson or something, guys aren't magicians. Drew Brees has had a winning record 50% of his seasons with the Saints. So – as good as he was in setting records and, and stuff, if you don't surround him with something, at least something. So let's see. But the, the, this will be, it looks like the first major domino to fall for the Jets 
the offensive coordinator position, and then we'll have a better idea of what whatever potential quarterback it is, whether it's Cousins or whether it's a rookie, what they might be coming into and what they might be looking at dealing with when they get in here day one. So we shall see. But it sounds like you kind of have talked yourself into Todd Haley. Um, yeah. I'm going to talk myself into things and then just not pulling the trigger. So we'll see what happens. All right, we're going to go into our first call of the night. Uh, it's Tyler. Tyler, um, we got some news to talk about. Uh, John Morton, if you've been on for the last early 30 minutes, uh, you were on pre-show, so you've heard all of our talks, you've heard all of our discussions. Uh, first question, I'll make it pretty simple. Do you like the move of getting rid of John Morton? Um, I'm not a big fan of him. Uh, I'm, my, my three candidates were like, Todd, Todd H. Um, Todd Haley. Todd Haley, yeah. Um, Jimmy Bates. And mm-hmm. that UCLA coach, Jim Mora. Oh, that, that's actually not a bad idea. Kind of unorthodox. I haven't heard it yet. Um, I don't know if he would come to the NFL. Well, you're talking about Jim Moore Jr., right? UCLA? Yeah, UCLA. Okay. Because Jim Moore, his father... I was kind of hoping for Jim Moore Sr., to be honest with you. I definitely have that soundbite. Yeah. I I know I have that soundbite. Scott, stall for me. I need to find it real quick. Well, I was hoping that it would have been Jim Moore Sr. that would come, because then we would definitely get some interesting outbursts. I know you're which outbursts you're going to play. But one of my other favorite ones was when he went on the whole rant about it's the famous Diddley Poo rant when he was the coach of the Saints. And he said, we couldn't run, we couldn't pass, we couldn't stop the run, we couldn't stop the pass, we couldn't do Diddley Poo out there. And it was one of the more entertaining rants that Jim Moore Sr. went on. Jim Moore Jr., he was the head coach of the Falcons for a while, and he, he's been at UCLA. I, I mean, what can you really say about him in terms of personality? He's not his old man, but I don't, know, I don't love Jim Moore Jr. all that much. I think that a lot of it is nepotism. I'll tell you who I would love, but he would never, uh, he would never take the job. I'm such a huge fan of Lane Kiffin. That's your boy down there, Kyle. That's your boy down there in Florida, Lane Kiffin. Yeah, uh, I love Lane Giffen and I hate him at the same time. He drips swagger, and he has that, like, he's basically me, if we're being honest. Uh, he subtweets people on Twitter. Uh, he watches an ungodly amount of film. Um, his hair changes, like, every time we see him, basically. And right now, he's in, like, a Twitter beef with some guy who we used to work with. So, Dude, did you hear what he said to Nick Saban after... They lost about, to Alabama. About texting his wife or something? No, no, no. When they, he, they, they, they went to shake hands after the game, and he says to him, congratulations, Nick. You'll never beat me again. Oof. Wow. That's, that's so – that is swagger deluxe right there, my man. That is just dripping off of his body. That's what that is right there. That is uh, – that's somebody we you know what I love. You know what I love about Lane Kiffin too, man? He'll do an interview on these talk shows, and it's not your standard coach garbage. Like, he's funny and interesting, which you don't see much at all with current coaches. You might see it with, like, retired coaches, but I I don't love Lane Kiffin. I know a lot of people don't like him, but I'm a big fan. I I, I don't like him as a coach. Uh, I don't think he's particularly great. He can't catch a bus, apparently. So that's a problem. Um, but Tyler, going back to your thing, Jim Moore Jr., I wouldn't be against that. I, I mean, I don't know if he would come to the NFL, though. Scott, any thoughts? Jim Moore Jr.? I don't know. I don't really know anything about whether or not he'd want to come to the NFL. Oh, here's oh, a little connect the dots for you. 
Um, Jim Mora Jr., head coach of the UCLA Bruins. You know who else was on the UCL Bruins this year? Yeah, I I should have said that, of course, but uh, as we know, for you back at home, that would cost that would cost one heck of a trade up. Um, all we really need to do is have him fail a drug test, and I know a couple quarterbacks out of California and Pittsburgh that have done that recently. So this is an interesting play, by the way, from uh, Charles McDonald. He he's talking about this over at Football Outsiders. He wrote, I highlighted Morgan earlier this year for Football Outsiders. He did a great job with that offense, far exceeded expectations. Whoever hires him gets a good coach. And then follows it up with, this is odd because everybody on that offense, with the exception of Matt Forte, had a career year. Fair point. Honestly, yeah. Robbie Anderson career year, Austin Severian Jenkins career year, Bilal Powell career year, uh, or Darius Stewart, Chad Hansen career years. Uh, well, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, now we're getting a little bit silly, but I got you. Now we're getting a little bit silly? We talked about Helen Keller for 15 minutes last week, Scott. That was just fun. I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, Tyler, do you have anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I, I got a question, and I, I want to talk to you guys about the draft. We have answers, and we are the right people for that. So go ahead. All right, let's, the, the Jets aren't, aren't sick, correct? Yes, the Jets have picked six. Um, oh, let me think. Uh, let's say we trade up to four, right? Okay. Uh-huh. Who would who would you take? Depends who's there, Ooh. man. Yeah, if we're trading up, that means somebody's <laughs> there. Um, who has the fourth pick? Let's see. So you have the uh, Colts are third. The yep. Giants are second. First pick is the Browns. The fifth pick is the Broncos, and the fourth pick is the Texans. Which belongs to the Browns. Wait, excuse me. Yes, which belongs to the Browns. I was just going to say it's the Texans pick, but it belongs to the Browns. Yes, so the Browns have the first and yeah, fourth picks. Tyler, I'm going to kind of defer your question here. I don't think that happens. I think they pick Saquon Barkley number one, and then they take their quarterback at number four. Eh, I think it may go the other way. I think you may they may get the quarterback at number one and then Barkley at number four. I'm I like quarterback number one and like an offensive line at or something. Um, their offensive line isn't horrible. Um, I would have to talk to Jeff a little more about it because he obviously knows more about the Cleveland roster than I do. But last time I checked, that you know they still have Joe Thomas. Um, they oh, not, have a no couple pieces on that O line. Um, right. What? Go go on. My bad. No, it's okay. Um, Scott, when I was talking about with the first pick, going to Saquon Barkley, everything I've been told from, you know, a couple of fast guys that I trust and who have been fairly accurate and I've had conversations with, they firmly believe that Saquon Barkley does not make it past the Giants. And that Dave Gettleman, who has taken a running back in every draft he's ever been a part of, will not pass on him. Look where it's gotten him. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I guess it also got him fired. I don't know, man. I think, look, I'm not going to tell you Barkley isn't really awesome. He obviously is. And I don't want to sound like a hypocrite because I also was one who felt like Leonard Fournette fell to the Jets at six, that I would have taken him just because I felt Fournette was a special talent. And that's why... Oh, sorry, I think ahead. Saquon Barkley is, like, a lot better than Leonard Fournette. I mean, we'll see. He might be. I thought I got I had the opportunity to watch Barkley in person once this year. Uh, I, I, of course, I ended up picking arguably his worst game of the season to attend live. But, yeah, the he's... Uh, hmm? The Maryland game? Michigan State. When they played Michigan, Michigan State, State, I was there. I'm trying to recall Michigan State's defense this year, if it's any good. 
Yeah, Michigan State won that game. Yes. Hmm. They limited him to I, he too much. Uh, they, they, I think at one point he actually had more yards receiving than rushing. But the point is... So you're saying he's a dual threat? That, Ooh, spins down. Boom, got No, him. I think... I think Saquon Barkley is, is an excellent player, and I think that he'll be a help running back. But I don't know, man. It's hard because, to me, the draft has so many talented running backs in multiple rounds. Ronald Jones is the one that Dalton likes a lot from USC. Yep. I know Rashad that. Penny. Yeah, I was going to say Joe Moss has been banging the drum about Rashad Penny for months. Uh, yep. Malsa the Machine, as I like to call him, because he did like 95 bowl game previews. So there's a lot. I mean, there's a ton of running backs in this draft, and I just, I don't know, man. Well, it's a ton of muscle, obviously. I don't know. It's so hard for me, especially, look, Le'Veon Bell is a perfect example, right? As yeah. awesome as Le'Veon Bell is, the guy's 25 years old, and how much tread does he have left on the tires is the question. Running backs wear out so fast that it's very difficult to justify kicking a running back at number one or number two overall in the draft. And if you do, man, especially on a team like the Brown, man, that's a tough thing to do because they need a quarterback so bad. So if you bypass potentially Rosen, Darnold, and even maybe Baker Mayfield to wait on your quarterback at number four, Man, it's a tough one. I just look. I guess if the if you think Barkley is that much better than everybody else in the draft, then go ahead and pull the trigger. I suppose. Man, it's a tough pill for me to swallow. I don't know. It it could happen. I was thinking he would go fourth, but maybe you're right. I don't know. I'm not as familiar with the thinking of uh, the those in the Browns front office to say Jeff where some of the other guys in Brown land are. But, man, that would be crazy to me. When's the last time running back went number one overall? It had to be, what, John Carter in 95? I can't think of another time. Even Reggie Bush slid to number two. Um, I think it's got to be in the 90s. I think it was Kajana Carter in 1995, yeah. It's just so right, hard to, to do that. Yeah, go ahead, man. I think it's Kajana Carter. It's entirely possible I'm wrong, but I think it's Kajana Carter. Like, even Marshall Falk didn't go number one overall. You know, some of these uh, – it's even very rare that a running back was in the top ten, although I know Christian McCaffrey did and Leonard Fournette both did. But as Joe Caparoso points out, and, and to be fair, you can't rely on every second and third round pick to be as good as Kareem Hunt or Jordan Howard, who's a fifth round pick, actually, and guys like that. But, man, it's tough when you watch, like, Alvin Kamara go in the third round, and then, you know, there's Christian McCaffrey, who I, I think is a very talented guy, and he went eighth, and these two guys that went significantly lower than him outperformed him and may end up being better players. It's, it's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, all right. I'm still looking this up, so you got to stall here for a second or ask some questions for Tyler. Okay. Tyler, let me ask you a question, man. You said you weren't a big fan of John Moore. Why is that? Um, I, I, I didn't really like his play calling that much. I mean, it's it's kind of a bit sloppy, but... Well, what did I you mean, think? What was sloppy about it? Sloppy's better sometimes, just remember. Sometimes, yeah, sloppy um, jokes. I mean, he... Oh, oh all right, well... I mean, fourth and two, they freaking punt the ball. Like, why? They did what? Fourth and two, they punt the ball. Did you say they punt the ball? What would that have to do with the offensive coordinator? I feel like that's more on top balls. But I... All right, all right, right, that's more on top. Um, okay, anyway, moving on. Let's so... think for the fences. I don't, I don't know. Just just move on. So anyway, uh, so basically, you're fine with them moving on from John Morton. You seem to say you like Todd Haley. Why, why is it you like Todd Haley? Todd Haley. Okay. So next question. What's your favorite color, Tyler? My favorite color is green. 
That's a good answer good. to the Jets podcast. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay. Do you own any Bitcoin? A Bitcoin? Oh, that might be a bad I've, year for I've you. I've heard of those. Hot take. If you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Uh, a maple tree. I like it because then you could get yourself some maple, maybe have a little pancakes with yourself. Uh, I dig that. That's good. I'm a pancake and guy that myself. Was, and that was talking. I don't. I don't know what that was. I. I don't know. Tyler, thanks for calling in, man. Yeah, thanks, man. I, I don't have a segment to give that. Like, I don't have a name off the top of my head. That was Talking Life with Scott Mason. We'll go with that. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still looking up running back taking number one overall. Like, there's not a list just compiled of that that I've found yet. Well, if you just go to, like, draft history, it'll give you every year, and you could just look at who went number one. Off the top of my head, let me see if I can remember this off the top of my head, all right? So this past year, the number one overall pick – was man, why am I trying to blame who the number one overall pick was this year? Was Wait, number one this year? And like having amnesia. Miles Kyle, Garrett. Who's number one this year, man? Miles oh, Garrett. Miles Garrett, right, right, right. Okay, so Miles Garrett. Then last year, number one was Goff, right? Then the yep. year before that was was that the Mariota Winston year? It was Jared Goff, right? Oh, the last running back? Uh, John Carter, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. 95. Yeah, I remember that. I was at that draft, actually. Penn State. You know who was the number one pick before that, though? Running back? One pick before, one pick before him. He was picked first. Who, who would have been before No, no, no. A running back, like the next running back that was picked number one overall. Oh, like, back before that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say, let's see. Wow, this would be a while because, all right, so let's see. 94, the fir- 1986, the first overall pick was, oh, man, let me think. Who was pick number one overall in 1986? 86 was the year that the Jets got who the heck did they get in 86? I don't even remember anymore. 85 was out soon. Give me a hint. You would not be doing well in a CTE study right now. I'm telling you. I think I've been dropped on my head too many times. Give me a, give me a hint in that draft. For some reason, I'm drawing a blank on who, who was in that. Give me a name or two that was in that draft, and it'll spark my memory probably. I can give you a hint on the player. Okay, you can do that too. His hip went pop, pop. Bo Jackson? Yep. <laughs> Bo was first. Oh, man, you know, for whatever Robert. reason. Well, Vinny was picked number one overall in 87, right? Yeah, the next year. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I always confused it, and, and for some reason thought that to keep thinking the two of them were in the same draft. Yeah, man, wow, what a... Because 85, the first pick was Bruce Smith, right? 85, yes, Bruce Smith. Okay. Yeah, and then 83 was the quarterback draft of L.A. Yeah, man, crazy times back then. Jeez. You know, you it's funny. We were ta- oh, sorry, go ahead. The Jets have only had the number one overall pick once, Keyshawn Johnson. Wasn't a bad That's pick. That's correct. They actually had it twice but traded it the other time. They had it number one in 96, and then they had number one again in 97 and traded it away. They traded down twice. The number one pick ended up being Orlando Pace, and then they traded down two times and ended up getting James Farrier, who didn't do anything with the Jets, and then went to the Steelers, and they, he played in a 3-4 scheme and played a lot better. Yeah, that's like the most Jets thing I've ever heard. I've actually never heard that story. I believe mm-hmm. it. Like, you could have just lied to me. That, I would agree with that. Well, yeah, what happened was, so in 97 was the year that Bill, well, the whole, here's the whole story, and it's kind of crazy. So, Kate Manning, at the time, was a junior. Tennessee. And they didn't want to come out. Yeah. yeah. 
and he didn't want to come out. Now, the story that came out, if you believe the reporting, is that Peyton was strongly, strongly leaning towards staying in Tennessee. And Archie Manning called ourselves and said, listen, Peyton is probably staying in school, but if anybody could talk him into coming to the NFL, it would be you. So if you want him to, if you want him to be your guy or whatever, you, know, you should try to convince him. And Bill never made the call, and the, supposedly the reason is because, and this is the reason he ended up trading out of the number one pick instead of picking Orlando Pace, who ended up becoming one of the greatest offensive linemen in NFL history. They, the Jets had just given up a handful of draft picks as compensation for getting Parcells from the Patriots. So Parcells felt like he needed to make up for that by trading down and recouping the picks that they lost. And so that, that's why that ended up happening. It's a shame, too, because, man, if they had convinced Manning to come out, obviously that's one thing. But even if they just stayed at number one and grabbed Orlando Pace, which I really wanted them to do at the time, I'm wrong plenty, but I was right on that one. Uh, that could have been a, one hell of a, uh, a slot to fill for a long time. And then if you would have had him and then they signed Kevin Mawai the next year, you have those two guys. I mean, that makes Brick and Mangold look like, you know, short change. So, oh, well, that's the story of the Jets, though, isn't it, Kyle? The decisions they don't make. Yeah. You know, we could have got to – this is going to be a tasteless joke. I'm definitely going to get in trouble for this. Um, Ray Cruz? Was that her name? Say, hmm? No, never mind. Um, you know, we could have got Peyton Manning to the Jets? Um. The weather girl in Indianapolis? I thought it was a training assistant at Tennessee. Oh, yeah, that too. That too. Yeah. So, Paul, well, who knows? If you believe the rumors, there's rumors that he was, there's some things that were going on with Peyton and some weather girl or something or news girl in Indianapolis. Yeah, that was, he mooned her, right? The girl in Tennessee, the training assistant? Oh, I thought he, like, no, I thought he did something way worse than that. No, from what I remember, he mooned, he mooned, or that was at least what I That's think it? Said. I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah, because I've been calling Peyton Manning like uh, a predator for multiple years. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man, Don Fry is the predator. I, I don't know, man. It, it, the thing about it is with Peyton Manning, I really at this time I wanted the Jets to be away at Peyton Manning. But that was such a weird thing, too, because it's the year before, the Jets had spent huge money on Neil O'Donnell. So to spend all that money on a quarterback, and then a year later you're drafting, you're, you're using the number one pick on Peyton Manning, it would have been kind of weird. But, yeah, it's always the, the guy the Jets don't get. It's always that, that door they don't go down somehow. You know, Blair Thomas over Junior Seau, right? That kind of move. Well, Ken O'Brien over Dan uh, Marino. Are you about yeah, to make a tasteless joke? No, no, I wasn't going to make a joke. Um, I thought you were going to do I something. Uh, say on it. Yeah, um, I'm thinking of one. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Kyle Brady over right Warren Sapp, obviously. There's another one speaking of predators, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> that's a real predator. He thought it was cute, though, so... It's okay. Well, you know what it is, man? I don't, I'm not excusing behavior. It's not in any way excusable. It's disgusting. However, you know how this goes. These guys are constantly surrounded by people that just want to be near them, just want to do anything they want all the time. And so it gets to the point where they feel like they're entitled to do whatever they want all the time. That's why you see this stuff where, you know, God, God love him. Even a lower level player like Rashad Robinson is eating edible candies in his damn car. Like, dude, just go to your house. Or, as Daryl Slater joked, wait a couple months when it's legal in New Jersey. You know, but geez, un- unbelievable. But like, so when you have a guy as as big and and um, powerful and uh, you know famous and rich and whatever as Warren Sapp, who's had everybody indulge everything he's ever wanted to do and get to the point where you legitimately start to believe that you can do everything that you want and the rules don't apply to you. So that's how that ends up happening. It's, it's crazy, though, man. That stuff, you read that, right? The stuff that he was doing, good Lord. 
at NFL Network? Yeah. Yeah, that that was not a great look for Warren. What do you even say to that? It's insane. All I'm saying is if I got that in the mail, um, I, I don't even know what I would do. Uh, I don't know, man. Somebody asked Jen. You know, it's funny. I didn't know this. Apparently, Geno Smith, a couple of years ago when he was yeah, on the Jets. Yeah, Jet News. Yeah. Yeah, you don't I had no idea. You don't no, I don't remember that. Dick pop up on the timeline one day? I do not remember this. Um, oh, all right. <laughs> Hold on. I'll search it on Twitter real quick. Geno. But, but, but the thing is, though, like, how many teams have more than one quarterback that's done that? And, and had the, the photos published, right? Because between him and Brett Favre, that's where I was going with that. It's like Jen Sturger, that poor woman. You know, I felt so bad for Jen Sturger, too, because the thing about Jen Sturger is, like, she didn't do anything wrong. And all these people just attacked her. Like, she's a slut or a hussy or whatever. And it's like, she didn't tell Brett Favre to text her pictures of his, you know, unit. And I don't know, man. It's well, weird. no, no, no. Didn't he send, like, Kodak out printed from, like, Walgreens, like, 9 millimeter photos or something? Oh, it's out? Man, that's even that's even worse. If he did, good yeah. lord. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't great quality. Uh, yeah, from what I heard, nothing was great quality there, but that's a whole other story and a whole other show. <laughs> but I... I I just felt like I felt so bad for Jen Sturger, though. All these, all these uh, people, like, good. those, those <laughs> I do my best every once in, a, once in a while, Kyle. Like, even those, those self-righteous, obnoxious ESPN, what's her name, Sarah Spain, who is, you have to love all women, yeah. and it's a woman that you don't like. I, I'm I not sh- going to get into that. No, 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 what I meant is that she was being nasty. I'm not talking about that. I just meant she was being nasty. She's going out there talking about how everything is you have to be pro-woman, and then she was so nasty to Jen Sturger. It's like, oh, apparently you're pro-woman. Oh, yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. That's what I meant. I'm not talking about the other. That's, I have no desire yeah. to talk about any of that. I'm not getting into that. You know me. I'm Mr. Avoid the Hot Topic stuff. But, yeah, no, that pissed me off with her, though. Because Jen Sturger, I felt so bad. She did nothing wrong, and... And she became the far pick girl, and uh, I I felt terrible for her family too. That whole thing was just awful. Who do you think got screwed worse in the Jets organization, Jen, uh, her, or Alex Diama? Hmm. I don't know this. Okay, so tell me what happened with her, because I don't really know the story. Um, Alex Diama rejected Ben and then showed up to work the next day and got fired. So Rejected Ben? Yeah, Ben. Ben slid in her DMs. For real? Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I got to go on the Jet Take Instagram account first. Hold on. But yeah, I'm pretty sure Wait, he did. What did he actually do? He asked her out? No, he made like small talk with her. <laughs> How did he get her DM? Did, did she followed you guys? Yeah, she followed the Jet Take uh, Instagram because he like when he went to the Patriots game a couple years ago, he like saw her at the game and like I think he took a photo of her and she like liked it and followed him or something. Oh boy. Yeah. Is Ben is Ben gonna be the next? <laughs> he gonna be the next one that that, that gets exposed. He's going to be the Mia Khalifa of the Jet Take world. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I think that's a good place to end it, honestly. Yeah. We're going to end on yeah, a high note right so. there. Yeah. Ben being Mia Khalifa. Yeah. All right. Like shout it. out your show because you do a much better show than the one we have here. Um, so go ahead. Do your thing. Well, that's not nice. Um, so let, let's start with I complimented gonna... you. I know, but I'm saying you're not nice to yourself. You should. I, I appreciate it, but you should talk up your own show. It's a good show. I enjoy it, even though I end up being the marriage counselor. Uh, so this week, we've got Play Like a Jet Friday, uh, part two of our discussion with Bruce Harper on his career. It's going to be a lot of fun. 
There's some interesting stuff this week, some funny stories about Walt Michaels, who was one of the greatest coaches in Jet history. There's a lot of story. Well, we'll get into it in future episodes, but there was a whole thing about how he ended up leaving the Jets, and so we'll talk about that. But there's going to be some funny banter about some things that Walt Michaels used to like to do and say. We're going to talk money with Bruce Harper, too. He's going to tell you about contract stuff and the amount of money that he was earning back then. And when he was telling me some of these stories, I blew my mind about some of the negotiations or lack thereof. So that'll be fun. We're getting into, I believe, 1979 this week. We went through the first couple of years of his career. So part two is Friday. You can find it at turnonthejets.com, iTunes, anywhere else where you can download podcasts. And then on Sunday, or actually I guess technically it would be Monday morning for your morning commute, or even if you want to save it for later and listen on your drive home, whatever you want to do, it's going to be part three of our off-season roundtable talking about what the Jets may do in free agency and what they should do in free agency. It's been a diverse group of voices so far. First week, we had Rich Semini, the longtime beat writer, who's now with ESPN New York, and Edward Guralik, who's our resident analytics expert who Kyle is afraid of. Might be the only guy on Twitter that Kyle is afraid of. Right, Kyle? Um, yeah. <laughs> and then this past week, we had a Jet... Uh, Jet Blog, Jet's Blog Podcast reunion with Corey Griffin and Brian Bassett. It was the first time that they had done a show together since they discontinued their own podcast a little while back. I was really looking forward to that, and it was so much fun for me because I was a huge fan of that podcast. So being able to talk Jets at those two at the same time, it was like I got to be on the Jet's Blog Podcast, so it was a nice thrill for me, and a lot of people really seemed to like it, so I was happy about that. And I'm hoping that the two of them will come back. They were talking a little bit afterwards, and who knows? They left the door open for the possibility of restarting their podcast. And then this week, we're going to have two very, very different voices. So we did the beat writers so far, right? And we're going to hear from more beat writers as time goes on as well. We did our analyst guy. This past week, we did the two... I guess you would say they're the OGs of the Jets podcast game, as Joe Caparoso says, because they were really the very first popular Jets po- uh, podcast. And so this week, we're going to go into it with a player, and in this case, it's Rob Carpenter, who used to play for the Jets. He's actually the very first guest on Play Like a Jet as well, talking about 90, 1992. But he's hopping on to talk about what he thinks. He obviously does a show over at NYJF TV. So he's got a perspective there from a player's point of view. And then we're going to talk to Jim Garrity, who is a senior political correspondent for National Review. He's a guy that gets paid to think and write and even has his own daily podcast. And he's also a lifelong Jets fan, just like maybe started following the team right around the same time. So we're going to have an interesting conversation. And there's going to be a bit of a back and forth, particularly on Kirk Cousins. We both lived in the DMV area. And... Both of us have fairly strong opinions on Cousins, but I think at this point, there was a little bit, I would say Corey Griffin wasn't super, super gung-ho on Kirk Cousins. I think that Ed was. I think that Brian Bass was, and I certainly am. So we're going to hear a little bit different from Jim Garrity, and it's, it's a different perspective too because Jim is a big fan, but he's also not a guy who covers the team the way the rest of us do. You know, Brian Bass said the Jets block for a long time. Corey Griffin works in sports full-time. Edward Gorelick studies the analytics. I'm somebody that writes for TOJ, and then obviously Rich Semini is the granddaddy of them all because he's been covering the Jets since before Kyle was even a thought in his parents' brain. And so being able to, to hear clarify, from... Int- I was never a thought, so... <laughs> Only parents could convince me of that. But, yes, uh, so Jim is a very smart guy and a longtime Jets fan, so we'll get that perspective as well. So we, we continue getting the wide variety of opinions on the roundtable. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. So the two podcasts, Friday and Monday. And then hopefully, I know you guys are fighting kind of like 
John and Paul did towards the end of the Beatles there. But I hope that you and Henry are able to work something out. And next Wednesday, when I call in, it's the two of you. No offense, Kyle. I love doing the show with you. But I feel like there's a certain dynamic missing with have the two of you at each other's throats the entire show. So yeah. let's hope that, uh, that you guys are able to figure out a way to work this out. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll see. All right. Um, there's Scott's shameless plugging. I got to do mine. You can follow us on Twitter that I'm currently blocked from. At the Jet Take. On Twitter, you can follow me personally on Twitter at Kyle the NFL. You can listen to us on iTunes, iHeartRadio, uh, Google Play. Just search the Jet Take, basically any podcast or YouTube. Obviously, you can find us on TOJ every week. Ben and I, uh, you know, we haven't written a lot recently, primarily because we're both pretty busy regarding school and stuff. But draft season comes around. Uh, I'm going to be scouting the cornerbacks for TOJ. Scott, what did you get? I wasn't. I didn't get assigned to anything yet. I've been so busy doing these podcasts that I haven't had really the time. It's funny. I don't oh, yeah. remember the last time I even wrote a column. I've been doing so many yeah, of these it, podcasts, man. I'm only a verbal guy now. I'm, I'm a verbal journalist, Big J. Um, I'm going to try and convince uh, Joe to give me credentials to like some sort of event. Oh, dude, you you're you're near the Pro Bowl, man. See if he'll get you credentials there. Yeah, honestly. I think you have to be 18, though. So I'll have to do it under my hmm. dad's name. So I was going to say, I don't know if he'll end up there as like an injury replacement or if he'd even want to go. But if Kirk Cousins somehow ends up there, man, you got to get out there and start trying to get the negotiations going a month early, man. you got to talk him into it coming. Yeah, I'll I'll do my best. All right. How far are you from Orlando, by the way? Oh, uh, traffic. Probably an hour and 45 minutes. All right, man. Well, if you do go to the Pro Bowl, full report. Yeah, I'll do a video breakdown and everything. Trust me. There you go. I'm going to talk Joe into that. I like it. All right, so we're going to end it. Talk to you guys next week. 69th episode of the Jet Take.